Section 14 of The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. The Case of the Dixon Torpedo, by Arthur Morrison, Part 2. It was about six o'clock when Hewitt returned alone but with a smiling face that told of good fortune at first sight. First, Mr. Dixon, he said, as he dropped into the easy chair in the private room, let me ease your mind by the information that I have been most extraordinarily lucky. In fact, I think you have no further cause for anxiety. Here are the negatives. They were not all quite dry when I, well, what, stole them, I suppose I must say, so that they have stuck together a bit, and probably the films are damaged. But you don't mind that, I suppose. He laid a small parcel, wrapped in a newspaper on the table. The engineer hastily tore away the paper and took up five or six glass photographic negatives of a half-plate size, which were damp, and stuck together by the gelatin films and couples. He held them, one after the other, up to the light of the window, and glanced through them. Then, with a great sigh of relief, he placed them on the hearth and pounded them to dust and fragments with the poker. For a few seconds neither spoke. Then Dixon, flinging himself into a chair, said, Mr. Hewitt, I can't express my obligation to you. What would have happened if you had failed? I prefer not to think of. But what shall we do with Ritter now? The other man hasn't been here yet, by the by. No, the fact is I didn't deliver the letter. The worthy gentleman saved me a world of trouble by taking himself out of the way, he would laugh. I'm afraid he has rather got himself into a mess by trying two kinds of theft at once, and you may not be sorry to hear that his attempt on your torpedo plans is likely to bring him a dose of penal servitude for something else. I'll tell you what has happened. Little Carlton Street, Westminster, I found to be a seedy sort of place, one of those old streets that have seen much better days. A good many people seem to live in each house. They are fairly large houses, by the way. And there is quite a company of bell handles on each doorpost, all down the side like organ stops. A barber had possession of the ground floor front at number 27 for trade purposes, so to him I went. Can you tell me, I said, where in this house I can find Mr. Hunter? He looked doubtful, so I went on. His friend will do, you know. I can't think of his name. Foreign gentleman, dark, with a bushy beard. The barber understood at once. Oh, that's Mirsky, I expect, he said. Now, I come to think of it, he has had letters addressed to Hunter once or twice. I've took him in. Top floor, back. This was good so far. I had got at Mr. Hunter's other alias. So, by way of possessing him with the idea that I knew all about him, I determined to ask for him as Mernsky before handing over the letter addressed to him as Hunter. A little bluff of that sort is invaluable at the right time. At the top floor back, I stopped at the door and tried to open it at once, but it was locked. I could hear somebody scuttling about within, as though carrying things about, and I knocked again. In a little while, the door opened about a foot, and there stood Mr. Hunter, or Mersky, as you like, the man who, in the character of a traveler in steam packing, came here twice today. He was in his shirt sleeves, and cuddled something under his arm, hastily covered with a spotted pocket handkerchief. I have called to see Monsieur Minsky, said I, with a confidential letter. Oh, yes, yes, he answered hastily. I know, I know. Excuse me one minute. And he rushed off downstairs with his parcel. Here was a noble chance. For a moment I thought of following him, in case there might be something interesting in the parcel. But I had to decide in a moment, and I decided on trying the room. I slipped inside the door, and, finding the key on the inside, locked it. It was a confused sort of room, with a little iron bedstead in one corner, and a sort of rough, boarded enclosure in another. This I rightly conjectured to be the photographic darkroom, and made for it at once. There was plenty of light within when the door was left open, and I made it once for the drying rag that was fastened over the sink. There were a number of negatives in it, and I began hastily examining them one after another. In the middle of this, our friend Mirsky returned and tried the door. He rattled violently at the handle and pushed. Then he called. At this moment, I had come upon the first of the negatives you have just smashed. The fixing and washing had evidently only lately been completed, and the negative was drying on the rack. I seized it, of course, and the others which stood by it. Who are you there inside? Mirsky shouted indignantly from the landing. Why for you to go in my room like that? Open this door at once, or I'll call the police. I took no notice. I had got the full number of negatives, one for each drawing, but I was not by any means sure that he had not taken an extra set, so I went on hunting down the rack. There were no more, so I set to work to turn out all the undeveloped plates. It was quite possible, you see, 
that the other set, if it existed, had not yet been developed. Mercy changed his tune. After a little more banging and shouting, I could hear him kneel down and try the keyhole. I had left the key there, so that he could see nothing. But he began talking softly and rapidly through the hole in a foreign language. I did not know it in the least, but I believe it was Russian. What had led him to believe I understood Russian, I could not at the time imagine, though I have a notion now. I went on ruining his stock of plates. I found several boxes, apparently of new plates, but as there was no means of telling whether they were really unused or merely undeveloped, but with the chemical impress of your drawings on them, I dragged every one ruthlessly from its hiding place and laid it out in the full glare of the sunlight, destroying it thereby, of course, whether it was unused or not. Mirsky left off talking, and I heard him quietly sneaking off. Perhaps his conscience was not sufficiently clear to warrant an appeal to the police, but it seemed to me rather probable at the time that that was what he was going for. So I hurried on with my work. I found three dark slides, the parts that carried the plates in the back of the camera, you know, one of them fixed in the camera itself. These I opened, and exposed the plates to ruination as before. I suppose no one ever did so much devastation in a photographic studio in ten minutes as I managed. I had spoiled every plate I could find, and had the developed negative safely in my pocket, when I happened to glance at the porcelain washing well under the sink. There was one negative in that, and I took it up. It was not a negative of a drawing like yours, but of a Russian twenty-ruble note. This was a discovery. The only possible reason any man could have for photographing a bank note was the manufacture of an etched plate for the production of forged copies. I was almost as pleased as I had been at the discovery of your negatives. He might bring the police now as soon as he liked. I could turn the tables on him completely. I began to hunt about for anything else related to this negative. I found an inking roller, some old pieces of blanket used in printing from plates, and in a corner on the floor, heaped over with newspapers and rubbish, a small copying press. There was also a dish of acid, but not an etched plate or a printed note to be seen. I was looking at the press, with the negative in one hand and the inking roller in the other, when I became conscious of a shadow across the window. I looked up quickly, and there was Mirsky, hanging over from some ledger projection to the side of the window and staring straight at me, with a look of unmistakable terror and apprehension. The face vanished immediately. I had to move a table to get at the window, and by the time I had opened it there was no sight or sound of the rightful tenant of the room. I had no doubt now of his reason for carrying a parcel downstairs. He probably mistook me for another visitor he was expecting, and knowing him must take this visitor into the room, threw the papers and rubbish over the press, then put all the plates and papers in a bundle, and secreted them somewhere downstairs, lest his occupation should be observed. Plainly, my duty now was to communicate with the police. So by the help of a friend, the barber downstairs, a messenger was found, and a note sent over to Scotland Yard. I awaited, of course, for the arrival of the police, and occupied the interval in another look around, finding nothing important, however. When the official detective arrived, he recognized at once the importance of the case. A large number of forged Russian notes had been put into circulation on the continent lately, it seems, and it was suspected that they came from London. The Russian government had been sending urgent messages to the police here on the subject. Of course I said nothing about your business, but while I was talking with the Scotland Yard man, a letter was left by a messenger addressed to Mirsky. The letter will be examined, of course, by the proper authorities, but I was not a little interested to perceive that the envelope bore the Russian imperial arms above the words Russian Embassy. Now why should Mirsky communicate with the Russian Embassy? Certainly not to let the officials know that he was carrying on a very extensive and lucrative business in the manufacture of spurious Russian notes. I think it is rather more than possible that he wrote, probably before he actually got your drawings, to say that he could sell information of the highest importance, and that this letter was a reply. Further, I think it quite possible that, when I asked for him by his Russian name, and spoke of a confidential letter, he at once concluded that I had come from the embassy in answer to his letter. That would account for his addressing me in Russian through the keyhole. And, of course, an official from the Russian embassy would be the very last person in the world whom he would like to observe any indications in his little etching experiments. But anyhow, be that as it may, Hewitt concluded, your drawings are safe now, and if once Mirsky is caught, and I think it likely, for a man in his shirt sleeves with scarcely any start and perhaps no money about him, hasn't a great chance to get away. If he is caught, I say, he will probably get something handsome at St. Petersburg in the way of imprisonment, or Siberia, or what not, so that you will be amply avenged. Yes, but I don't at all understand this business of the drawings even now. How in the world were they taken out of the place? And how in the world did you find it out? Nothing could be simpler. And yet the plan itself was rather ingenious. I'll tell you exactly how the thing revealed itself to me. From your original description of the case, many people would consider that an impossibility had been performed. Nobody had gone out, and nobody had come in, 
and yet the drawings have been taken away. But an impossibility is an impossibility after all, and as drawings don't run away of themselves, plainly somebody had taken them, unaccountable as it may seem. Now, as they were in your inner office, the only people who could have gotten at them besides yourself were your assistants. So that was a pretty clear that one of them, at least, had something to do with the business. You told me that Worsfeld was an excellent and intelligent draftsman. Well, if such a man as that intended treachery, he would probably have been able to carry away the design in his head, at any rate a little at a time, and would be under no necessity to run the risk of stealing a set of the drawings. But Ritter, you remarked, was an inferior sort of man. Not particularly smart, I think, were your words, only a mechanical sort of tracer. He would be unlikely to be able to carry in his head the complicated details of such designs as yours, and being in a subordinate position, and continually overlooked, he would find it impossible to make copies of the plans in the office. So that, to begin with, I thought I saw the most probable path to start on. When I looked around the rooms, I pushed open the glass door of the barrier, and left the door to the inner office ajar, in order to be able to see anything that might happen in any part of the place, without actually expecting any definite development. While we were talking, as it happened, our friend Mirsky, or Hunter as you please, came into the outer office, and my attention was instantly called to him by the first thing he did. Did you notice anything peculiar yourself? No, really, I can't say I did. He seemed to behave much as any traveler or agent might. Well, what I noticed was the fact that as soon as he entered the place, he put his walking stick into the umbrella stand over there by the door, close by where he stood. A most unusual thing for a casual caller to do, before even knowing whether you were in. This made me watch him closely. I perceived with increased interest the stick was exactly the same kind and pattern as one already standing there, also a curious thing. I kept my eyes carefully on those sticks, and was all the more interested and edified to see, when he left, that he took the other stick, not the one he came with, from the stand, and carried it away, leaving his own behind. I might have followed him, but I decided that more could be learned by staying, as, in fact, proved to be the case. This, by the by, is the stick he carried away with him. I took the liberty of fetching it back from Westminster, because I conceived it to be Ritter's property. Hewitt produced the stick. It was an ordinary thick Malacca cane, with a buckhorn handle and a silver band. Hewitt bent it across his knee and laid it on the table. Yes, Dixon answered. That is Ritter's stick. I think I have often seen it in the stand. But what in the world? One moment. I'll just fetch the stick Mirsky left behind. And Hewitt stepped across the corridor. He returned with another stick, apparently an exact facsimile of the other and placed it by the side of the other. When your assistants went into the inner room, I carried the stick off for a minute or two. I knew it was not Worsfeld's, because there was an umbrella there with his initial on the handle. Look at this. Martin Hewitt gave the handle a twist and rapidly unscrewed it from the top. Then it was seen that the stick was a mere tube of very thin metal, painted to appear like Malacca cane. It was plain at once that this was no Malacca cane. It wouldn't bend. Inside it, I found your tracings rolled up tightly. You can get a marvelous quantity of thin tracing paper into a small compass by tight rolling. And this, this was the way they were brought back? The engineer exclaimed. I see that clearly. But how did they get away? That's as mysterious as ever. Not a bit of it. See here, Mirsky gets hold of Ritter, and they agree to get your drawings and photograph them. Ritter is to let his confederate have the drawings, and Mirsky is to bring them back as soon as possible so that they shall be missed for a moment. Ritter habitually carries this Malacca cane, and the cunning of Mirsky at once suggests that this tube should be made in outward facsimile. This morning Mirsky keeps the actual stick, and Ritter comes to the office with a tube. He seizes the first opportunity, probably when you were in this private room, and Worsfeld was talking to you from the corridor, to get at the tracings, roll them up tightly, and put them in the tube, putting the tube back in the umbrella stand. At half-past twelve, or whenever it was, Mirsky turns up for the first time with the actual stick and exchanges them, just as he afterwards did when he brought the drawings back. Yes, but Mirsky came half an hour after they were... Oh, oh, yes, I see. What a fool I was. I was forgetting, of course. When I first missed the tracings, they were in this walking stick, safe enough, and I was tearing my hair out within an arm's reach of them. Precisely. And Mirsky took them away before your very eyes. I expect Ritter was in a rare funk when he found that the drawings were missed. He calculated, no doubt, on your not wanting them for the hour or two they would be out of the office. How lucky that it struck me to jot a pencil note on one of them. I might easily have made my note somewhere else, and then I should never have known that they had been away. Yes, they didn't give you any too much time to miss them. Well, I think the rest pretty clear. I brought the tracings in here, screwed up the sham stick, and put it back. You identified the tracings and found none missing, and then my course was pretty clear, though it looked difficult. I knew you would be very naturally indignant with Ritter, so, as I wanted to manage him myself, I told you nothing of what he had actually done, 
for fear that in your agitated state you might burst out with something that might spoil my game. To Ritter I pretended to know nothing of the return of the drawing, or how they had been stolen. The only things I did know were certainty, but I did pretend to know all about Mirsky, or Hunter, when, as a matter of fact, I knew nothing at all, except that he probably went under more than one name. That put Ritter into my hands completely. When he found the game was up, he began with a lying confession. Believing that the tracings were still in the stick, and that we knew nothing of their return, he said that they had not been away, and that he would fetch them, as I had expected he would. I let him go for them alone, and, when he returned, utterly broken up by the discovery that they were not there, I had him altogether at my mercy. You see, if he had known that the drawings were all the time behind your bookcase, he might have brazened it out, swore that the drawings had been there all the time, and we could have done nothing with him. We couldn't have sufficiently frightened him by the threat of prosecution for theft, because those things were in your possession, to his knowledge. As it was, he answered the helm capitally, gave us Mirsky's address on the envelope, and wrote the letter that was to have got him out of the way while I committed burglary, if that disgrace expedient had not been rendered unnecessary. On the whole, the case has gone very well. It has gone marvelously well, thanks to yourself. But what shall I do with Ritter? Here's a stick. Knock him downstairs with it, if you like. I should keep the two, if I were you, as a memento. I don't suppose a respectable Mirsky will ever call to ask for it. But I should certainly kick Ritter out of the door, or out of the window, if you like, without delay. Mirsky was caught and after two remands at the police court, was extradited on the charge of forging Russian notes. It came out that he had written to the embassy, as Hewitt had surmised, stating that he had certain valuable information to offer, and the letter which Hewitt had seen delivered was an acknowledgment and a request for more definite particulars. This is what gave rise to the impression that Mirsky had himself informed the Russian authorities of his forgeries. His real interest was very different, but was never guessed. I wonder, Hewitt has once or twice observed, whether, after all, it would not have paid the Russian authorities better on the whole if I had never investigated Mirsky's little note factory. The Dixon torpedo was worth a good many twenty-ruble notes. End of the case of the Dixon torpedo by Arthur Morrison. Recording by Todd.